Welcome to the Smith and Rowland Show. Let's join our host, Alan Smith and Jeff Rowland. Welcome to the Smith and Rowland Show. How's everybody doing? Wonderful, Jason. How are you? My goodness, Jeff. Do you see our Facebook page? He's got people all over that page. Who does? He's got old old at hearts here. Yeah. I have laptop envy, though. Where's you your go. laptop at? Would you? Would you, would you <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. You said Facebook. I'm not there yet. Well, you gotta wait. give me time. We don't. The show will be over, Roland. Yeah. Hey, listen. I'm a technological wonder. Wonder. Yeah. Yeah. You always wonder where the wonder technology is. <laughs> Wondering where you are doesn't count. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. Well, y'all had a good week. Have a good Sunday. Good Sunday. Mm-hmm. Good Sunday. We got a uh, old uh, heart attack. Old heart attack. What? No, no, old, don't say old, that. old at heart. Old at heart. So we got him here today. <laughs> well, we got tired of reading his little notes on yeah. Facebook, and we decided to do just him to here. ship him in. Basically, the reason we shipped him in, my wife even she said was Cody and his wife at church, and I said, yeah, they was there. She said, why does he hang out with Jason? I said, I don't know. It's something we'll talk to. <laughs> it is a mystery, but I don't know. I'm trying to be a good role model. That's yeah, good. Well, that's that's, uh, that's that good. He'll, he needs that. He does need that <laughs> in his life. That's right. He does. As you can see. <laughs> what are we talking about today, guys? Well, tragic report reveals thousands of journalists still have not been laid off. I also found a report that says that Texas finds loophole with new super ouchy pokey wire. So it's not <laughs> razor wire. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> Texas finds loophole with new super ouchy pokey wire. <laughs> not razor wire. <laughs> I want to say something so no, bad. No, no. Oh, please let me. No, know. no. It, this listen, a, this is a podcast. No, this is a so Christian. I have to do this. Christian podcast. There's something in have. me. I have no. to do it. Well, I know, but that's that part that's I have not a saved friend. Yet. I have a friend, and his name is Colt Bass, and oh, it's yeah? reminded me of it, that mm-hmm. last article. Yeah. Go part of the top again. Super and, Pokey Wire. Yeah, so. What Colt, does that remind you of? Colt Bass? Colt Bass. All right, here's what Colt Bass said to me. <laughs> That <laughs> now you wait, wait, tell the story. You went fishing. I went fishing with, with Colt. Oh, yeah. And we was going down the road, and Colt said, I ain't preacher. I said, What, Colt? He said, I was wondering if we could come up with a list of approved Christian cuss words because Alch ain't working no more. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> Super ouchy pokey wire. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's made in Japan by the Crazy Aggressive Security Corporation. So they they're also, saying that this is not razor wire. No, no, it's ouchy pokey. pokey it's, it's approved yeah. razor wire. Yeah, yeah. yeah see approved. there? It goes back That's to that. We need wire. a list of approved Christian <laughs> cuss words. <laughs> and we also have <laughs> oh, cold. Uh, Joel Osteen sees on shadow predicts another you? year of taking the Bible out of context. <sighs> <laughs> that's terrible. That's the news that I can bring to you today. Hopefully, that is somewhat. In, you hang out. I actually, so I told him about this when I read yeah, this. He, this is from in, him when I was in a meeting Friday, and and you read. Bust, I busted out laughing. Joel Osteen, sees and everybody was questioning, uh, you know, what I was laughing at. So I had to, I had to read it out. So <laughs> reason that pains me a little. I've seen. The exact same headlines, but it had Roland's picture I was there. About to say. Yeah, yeah, I figured y'all would do something like it. Say something, you, you know. know um, I, I figured it. No, it's okay. about, My shoulders are big enough to handle it. So I was talking to, to <laughs> Old at Heart before this uh, podcast, and yes. he was saying that he went to church this morning. He visited this new church, and he oh, said, boy, "Here we go." It, he said that pastor. He said he just didn't know what to say about it. He said it was just earth shattering. Oddly enough, let me just say, <laughs> it just so happens you can hear really much. Yeah, he was exactly right. Um, <laughs> Cody and his wife was at the Grace Place today. Oh, at where you preached. Yeah. And oddly enough, when I just asked Cody, well, what do you want to talk about today? You know what he said? How to find a good church. Yeah. And he was just at one. Well, everybody's an example. That's exactly right. I mean, oh, everybody's cow. an example. Well, I need, I need to take a sword and cut my heart out. Well, I need to ask his question. I need to ask his question. Let me ask his question. I heard, and Cody, you'll have to vouch for it, that all day long that Roland hogged the microphone. <sighs> he did. Okay. See? 
Rest my case. Let me tell you. There we go. I am not the pastor of the church. No, I preach. Yeah, yeah, he says that all the time. <laughs> no, no. We I all preach know there it. occasionally. Joe Barrett's the pastor. He's sick with COVID. My wife leads the worship. She's sick as well. So that left somebody had to do it. Well, I called Cody this morning, <laughs> like seven o'clock, and it I goes, said, Cody. "Look, Cody, have a special song ready and at least one teaching." Now, you know what I got out of him? Heartaches. That's <laughs> all he Cody, offered. This this is the Babylon Bee. See, he goes yeah. from kind of from Babylon Bee. I thought uh, you were the pastor. I am not the pastor. He's the pastor. No, you're don't let you're him a pastor. Him. No. He is no, a really See, pastor. this is the problem with Roland. He refuses to accept it's the calling. call that God has on his life. That's right. Come on, Jay. Come on, baby. No, uh-huh. I, what I refuse to accept, Cody, is the way others define my call. <laughs> I and preached there. That was part of your message. There. It was, yeah, yeah. I preach there when the Lord says preach. I sing when the Lord says sing. I do whatever somebody says that I do. I'm a truck driver, but I'm See, not the pastor. Nowhere am I listed mm-hmm. as the pastor. Therefore, I cannot be fired. <laughs> you okay? This listen. I have one. Uh, I just wanted. To I had this in. little word come in on Cody's behalf. You know, our producers watching, and yes. she watches everything we say. Yes, she does, and she'll tweak us pretty good. She but will. so she sent in this little message that says, mm-hmm. "If someone knew uh, was at Jeff's church today." They would have to think that the pastor was a narcissistic control freak. <laughs> <laughs> now, by the way, now, by, the way <laughs> hey, by the way, by the way, if I have any position or title, I am Karen Elliott's employee. So that, there you go. I'll I just here. said producer. I didn't call her name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still probably. Uh, I'll have a written reprimand. For yeah, you. that's right. So, since you're not a pastor, maybe you can weigh in on these questions. How do you find a good church? These how, days, how does these one days. use spiritual discernment in locating a church? That's I think that's a, a very good that's question. A, you know, people want, they say we want to have a New Testament church. We all we would ask them, okay, well. Which one do you, you want? want the Galatian church? Yeah, you want the, the Corinthian church? church? The Corinthian church? <laughs> Thessalonica church? There's so many different personalities in churches and expressions in churches. And we believe that God's placed us in the body as it pleases Him. I do believe this. Not every church is for everybody. And it's a fallacy to think that it is. Sure. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, just because there is a church that may not share the same expression that you do, I think that doesn't lessen our obligation to support that work, pray for that work, all of those things. Mm-hmm. To find a a community or family or home in a church, that is something that, that is unique to the individual. That's outside, I think, of the boundaries of doctrine and some of the prerequisites mm-hmm. that we have fought. You You're have to culture. Fi- yeah, yeah. I'm talking about pers- spiritual personality sure. and expression. Naturally, I would say find a church that preaches the Word of God, that believes the Word of God, that their doctrine is right. I don't think we've paid enough attention to that over the, the last few decades. And as a result of it, there's some generational shortcomings doctrinally and with the lack of the knowledge of the word i was telling alan this i can worship to i'll fly away as far as just stylistically in music and that personality and that expression i like those old hymns i like sure and you've been into grace place no we do original songs that my Mm. wife writes and i don't even know what you would classify many of them it is a sound that is original to that congregation most of the stuff she writes is birthed out of being there and birthed out of things that are said there messages that are preached there so it, it kind of bears that expression but i can go into an old time mountain church that still says hey everybody come up here and get in the choir and sing i'll fly away and i love that stuff sure. i think that the prerequisite for me if i was in search of a church i want to find a church where I am free to be me. That's a scary thought. That is. I mean, think of that. Well, it's took me 60 years to find a grace place. And I've been spending 59 uh, of them trying to keep you from being. That's right. But a church that I can be me and feast off of the Word of God that is doctrinally sound 
And now everybody's going to have their own bent on doctrine. So I think you have to come to the realization of what do you believe? And I would ask you the question, if you're looking for a church, have you met you yet? So you're saying maybe your theology isn't a direct reflection of your dress? <laughs> I knew that would get Jason. <laughs> I'm trying to understand the question. Evidently, he knows you're a cross-dresser. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, yes. I'm, just, I'm just saying. You hang out with these people. <laughs> he's talking about religious spirit. Well, yeah. He's, I yeah know, there's, there's we some, all know what you're saying. There's some background there, yeah. The, the, you know, there's, uh, there's we were, some churches, obviously. If you don't dress a certain way, yeah. I was you raised might in be that kicking church. bricks, right? I was raised so. in that church. So... Let's call that for what it is just real quickly, okay? I surrendered to preach and served on staff in a church that would not allow a lady to sing in the choir if she wore colored hose. Men had to wear neckties. A woman who had on anything other than a dress was living in rebellion against God. That's the way it was defined. So did they let the women speak at all? No, wasn't even allowed to say amen. They would be called down for say. I've been in services where they would call a woman down for saying amen in church. Steeped in a religious spirit is what was going on. It was a militant, legalistic style sure. of, of church. I was raised in kind of that atmosphere. So for me encountering God and allowing grace to set me free, I naturally looked for another place to serve and to be a part of because that expression no longer served my spirit. But let me just play the advocate here just a little bit. They ministered at times to a group of people that needed that kind of discipline. Sure. And as a result of it, it nurtured them in their walk and in their relationship. So I'm not going to say, even though I disagree with a lot of the, the process thinking that gets you to righteousness through those kind of activities, I will quickly say that there are some who need those kind of disciplines to nurture them in their walk with God where they are at that moment. But not a reflection of theology in one, no. one sense or the other. No. So, but you, but you got to carry it all the way out to the overreaction of ties and dresses and all this. It's a, it is legalistic. It is religious spirit and legalism. But most of it is spurred out of what happens in with legalism is you, you you have a law, then you create a law so you don't break the law, so you create a law so you don't break a law. You know how, how it works. You know how it was with Israel. And uh, you had the laws, and then you created this, this other book of laws so you didn't break those laws. But we would probably think it's ridiculous that dresses or ties or I mean to us all sitting here that's like come on now how stupid is that and the topic is clothing but if some lady or man came in and had on very little clothing then all of a sudden we'd be in the clothing business sure. so you, you got to keep <laughs> you got to keep it all in the right <laughs> yeah. context is my point well my wife was yeah. saying this she kind of brought this up to light she she said I wonder if all the focus on clothing is a reflection that all clothing is of sin nature because we weren't even wearing clothes, Adam and Eve, until mm-hmm. after the fall. But the hiccup there is we've done all falling. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right, right. you better you better grab the nearest fig leaf. That's right. Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> so, we, we would at least <laughs> recommend. But to say what she's saying, we'd, not, we'd have to agree with. There, oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your focus is there. But at the same time, if some women came in and they weren't covered much up on top or whatever, like said, pass, God, out, God. pass out the fig. Leaf. Yeah, yeah, pass yeah. out the fig. Our wives would be the first to speak up. Yes, the the men would be second, but That's the true. wives would be first. But so, <laughs> so, so I'm I'm saying the clothes. It's it's not the clothes because if we're all against dresses and ties and all that to a, to a degree. All of a sudden, I'm against it being here. a requirement to. It's the religious it's, side of that right. thing. Yeah, but at the same time, we got to be careful because the opposite of that is you don't have enough clothes on. You know, oh, for yeah. instance, and so and so it lets us know. My point here is, it's that the clothes is, is still not the issue, because if a woman's not covered, right, you want her to cover. That's using clothes. So, actually, the clothes is not the issue. Control is sure. 
is control and con- conformity. So some people believe in Christianity that when you go in and out of the church house, you need to look like a bunch of penguins. Y'all got the same clothes. Y'all look exactly alike. Same, same haircut. That's, yada, right. Yada, yada. That's right. So look like a bunch of penguins, but with a bunch of penguins, you can't name them, you can't pick them out. Because they all look alike, sure. you see. So you tend to lose your personal identity with a religious spirit. And can I just <clears> put, <throat> put something in there? We're talking about clothes. We're talking about those are natural expressions of a congregation. We haven't even started talking about the spiritual expression of a congregation. Sure, like you said this morning, have we even graduated to that point? Yeah, I don't think we have. <laughs> right. I, I really don't think we have, in a lot of ways. Right. I don't want this to come out wrong, so Lord help me with my words. But most of the churches that I preached in when I first started preaching, I would not be allowed to preach there again. Some because I have facial hair. Others, be- you know, just because they know me. <laughs> but, but seriously, I mean, there's... The term legalist and legalism is almost a relative term in light of what Alan was talking about a minute ago. We can say we're not legalists, but in one sense we are because we wouldn't allow a lady to come into the to the church wearing nothing. Well, you know, I mean, unless you're from I mean, California so, back in the Jesus days. I think I'm still a little bit too Baptist for that. To some degree, we are all legalistic to, in some in some way sure so that term is a, is a relative, relative term and i'm not real sure that it's um, in the strictest biblical context we would have to understand there are certain things of behavior that god expects and requires to find the expression that we're looking for in a church requires us to look deeper than the natural and look at the spiritual expression. So that kind of goes back to the original question, right? Yeah. How does one utilize spiritual and scriptural discernment yeah. in selection of a church? Can I give a short answer to that? And then I'd like for y'all to comment on it. Most people look for a church that serves them when they should be looking for a church they can serve. Most people Within also... Within certain parameters. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, I do believe the biggest requirement of looking for a church is looking for a church that teaches sound doctrine. Sure. I think that's the overriding part. But you get into a place where where are you walking in your life and what is the depth of spiritual reality of the church that I'm at? I do believe that that, that is something that has to be weighed. Sure. But I, I was thinking about this just the other day. I got saved at the age of six. And what got me started thinking about this, I have a friend who... Uh, is fixing to have a child. And this friend that's fixing to have a child, I told them, you know, okay, look, if I'm going to be a part of your life, by the time the child is the age of six, it's going to be able to quote the book of Ephesians and tell you what it means. That's true. At the age of six, I got saved. I began learning the Word of God at the age of six. And I'm telling you, the Word of God can be learned even if you're a small child. Oh, my kids are testament to Absolutely. That. I was preaching, I think it was last week, and your daughter came to me and quoted back to me things that I had I had said that she had learned the week before and sure. added to it. You know that that can happen. And I'm, I'm using that to say this. There's a lot of people that looks for a church where they can drop their kids off at romper room while they go into the... I just don't think that's right. That's not properly... That's not using discernment to look for a good church right if that makes any sense yeah yeah that's kind of where we were at i mean we've a couple of little kids and you know i felt like we were visiting a couple of places and it's like encouraged to you know the, we don't want to hear children yeah and please yeah take them out of here we have all the amenities and that you would ever need yeah i take it back to the scripture you can quote it probably better than i can but you know just the separation of the congregation. Yeah. I, I feel like. Almost segmenting the congregation sure. into divisions sure. of, well, we're going to have this for the small children. We're going to have this for the teenagers. We're going to have this. And you correct me. I was raised the same way I was. When we was coming up, I was made to sit on the front row by my dad. If I sneezed, giggled, or fidgeted too much, I got one flick to the back of the <laughs> ear. That one flick meant sit still. The second flick meant when we get out of here, you're getting your backside tanned. I sat and listened to the preacher, and I learned the Word of God. There is a supernatural transference 
of spiritual information from someone who is under the anointing that's preaching that even small children can learn from. Sure. And that's how I learned the word. There was no such thing as you go to church, then you got children's church, teen church, adult church. No, we didn't have all that. We had church. I feel like if they catch one little piece of the of the sermon, that they're yeah. probably getting more than that's right. a seasoned individual anyway. That's right. That's not saying that I'm against nurseries. Sure. Neither am I against children's church. I think that if you have an anointed children's church pastor or leader— Praise God. That's wonderful. But I am saying that there are a lot of people who look for romper room to drop their kids off so mm-hmm. they can go and enjoy the service, of which they're really not enjoying. They're just wanting to get away from their kids. I think that that, that goes on. I just have one question. Yeah. What's a romper room? You know, Isn't that the vacuum that... Goes around no, in your house. Y'all are too young. <laughs> Roomba. Yeah. Rumpa Roomba. No, you got to bring, bring your I language see, in. I see Jason. I see Cody. <laughs> that was an old show about the oh, Rumpa. Yeah. Well, I use that in terms of there's a lot of churches, and I've been to them. I've sung at these churches mm-hmm. that are huge churches, and you walk into the children's facility. They got bouncy houses in the building. They got all of these things where they you drop your kids off. They play while you go to church. You pick your kids up, and you go home. It's daycare. Not church. That's all it is. It's a daycare. And I'm not against nursery or children's ministry. There are people who are anointed to do that. But there are a lot of churches that don't have anointed individuals to deal with children. And when you don't have anointed individuals to deal with children, you're basically dropping them off and they're they're coloring in coloring books till you get done. I think that is a waste of what we should be doing with our children. That's all. What about, like I was, I was raised in church my whole life. I don't ever remember not going to church. But there's a lot of people that's never been to church. And so, like, for me, I felt like I, I grew up in the culture that I'm in. I grew up in the culture at New Life. I'm used to that. I feel like that's a big part of who I am. But there's a big group of people that I believe, like Cody, didn't grow up in yeah, church. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the exact there's no, I, like, there. no He doesn't even know what he's looking for. I think what you said earlier about have you met yourself there is a really good, that was a really good line. Yeah, like I, well, and I think that's required. I do think that's required. Daddy, Daddy Pete looks like he wants to say something. Yeah, about jump to, in or out. I'm, in, I'm enjoying all of the uh, <laughs> bad answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, truthfully, I was ra- I was raised in an independent, fundamental, premillennial, militant Baptist church. I was Did raised you in slip in dispensationalist. Do what now? Did you slip in dispensationalist? I forgot it. Yeah, I was raised independent, dispensational, <laughs> premillennial, fundamental. As just as militant as you can be, Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, King the, James if, only. King James. Oh yeah, King James. That, that goes without saying. When the pastor would walk by, if my hair was touching my ears, he would point at me and he'd say, "You get to the barber shop this week." I mean, it was that kind of a. I never now, could tell you were raising. Now country. here's here's the thing. I knew that there was other expressions out there, mm-hmm. and I had a privilege as a teenager. Because of singing and music, we would go to these various other expressions. That did me a world of good, by the way. Sure. A world of good. It expanded the, the borders for me to know there's a lot of different people out there, and they're, they all love Jesus, too. And then you met me. And then I met Jason and knew that that was a case that maybe you could lose your salvation. I don't know. <laughs> you know but nonetheless, I'm saying that it does matter that there are many expressions in the body. God designed it that way. And he has placed people in the body as it pleases him. If you're going to really find a church where you say, bud, this is home, then you got to meet yourself. I I really believe that. But you got to meet yourself spiritually, not meet yourself culturally or meet yourself naturally, but meet yourself spiritually to know where you belong. You can't discern what you're looking at if you haven't discerned yourself yet. It's been a taxing process, but we've we've really enjoyed enjoyed the process, though, because of, like Jason said, I wasn't raised in church. I didn't, I I was saved at 27. Okay. Was just going to church for a little bit and stayed at that church for 10 years and now we're in the process so i'm now at the point that it seems that where you were playing your music and looking around a little bit yeah yeah it's been fun well i was thinking about his original question is say it again how can you decide how how does one use spiritual spiritual and 
theological, scriptural discernment and selection? I, is that, that's, that is a, that's well. a good, Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, discernment means the ability to separate good from evil, sure. to separate truth from a lie. That's what discernment is. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to do that. Uh, separate good from evil, truth from a lie. Discernment means to your, it's kind of like the same uh, word of, as Christians were to be set apart. So that's what discernment is. So when you look at a church, you're looking to see, number one, your discernment says, is it good or evil? You know, now this has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with preference. It just means, is this good or evil? Is this bad or good? Is this wisdom or foolishness, as an example? That's what discernment sure. is. And so when you're looking for a church, all the other preferences of culture and all, and all to me, has nothing to do with true spiritual discernment. That's just culture and sure. the like. So to answer your question, I would look at a, for a place that has, just like you say, good doctrine, good Bible teaching. I wouldn't want a bunch of, I think it's, uh, I understand why they separate the children and have children's church and stuff. I understand that in, in a lot of cases. In our case, I, my children, I didn't do that with my children. Wisdom told me that I wanted mine in the service. I don't care if they don't understand it. I want them to at least learn enough discipline that they would sit there because I knew that was healthy. And then I knew as they started growing up that they would be under the influence of the Holy Spirit and teaching. Also, in that day, in a church service, you might, what we would call, um, it was when the Spirit was moving, somebody might stand up and testify or somebody would get saved and run down crying or something. I wanted my children to see those things. And uh, I even took my children when they were real young. I had a lot of black friends and black congregations. I took my children around to black services and black churches. I wanted them to be exposed, and they, it was true spirituality. So to me, it has nothing to do with color, nothing even to do with culture, even though we got our preference. I don't think it's true, to answer your question, true spiritual discernment. You're looking to see if it's good or bad, foolishness versus wisdom. To me, some of the children's activities is just foolishness to me. I'm not saying they all are. You know, in some in some cases, uh, you have churches that bus in a lot of children from poor areas that have no discipline whatsoever, so they don't have parents to sit there with them and to take them through those things. So, right. so you can see how it's needed that you would have a. And do I expose you know, to my children to those children? Well, that's your that's your question. Right. You have to say, do I use wisdom? Do I use discernment? Do I do that or do or do I not? But that's where that's the reason you, that to use the word spiritual discernment, as far as it being a practice in the church, I think it's fine. Is that what I'm to do? Is you know, as a priest of my family, you have to use spiritual discernment for your family. Sure. But you wouldn't want to keep other children that don't have that get a mother father situation. You want the church to be able to provide something for them also. You see, and even if a church did provide that, and you wanted yours to be in the service. I chose to keep mine in the service. Sure. Of course, I, it wasn't even too much of an option then, but it wouldn't make any difference because I was very particular in that, and Jeff was too. We wanted our children to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit movement within a church yeah. meeting because we got to experience a lot of that. And so your children get to see, and now the sad part is you can have your children and uh, keep them in the congregation, keep them quiet and all that, but it's sad when they're not in a church that they can experience what I'm talking about. That's right. To keep them in the service is not the answer for everything. If you hear what I'm saying, sure. what you are looking for a church that has a spiritual air to it, that it would invoke uh, something to a child that was sitting there. I remember when I was uh, my first encounter in the Baptist church, I was probably 10 years old, and this man hollered, jumped up crying, and ran down to the altar. I'd never seen that in my life scared the bejeebies out of me. I thought, this man's a lunatic. But that was my first experience to a 30-some-year-old man getting born again. I mean, it, it he shot out of there like a cannon. To a 10-year-old boy, it scared me. But the experience to be uh, sitting there and to have that experience that's, I mean, the idea is not to keep me, it's okay, let me get a little scared. You know, that's my children. I want them to experience 
true spirituality. But I remember that was one of my first encounters, which I thought was good. At the time, I, it, was, it scared me to death, you know what I'm saying? But it was good. I know at uh, Jeff's church, when some of my, my children were smaller, we were there. Now, we had some services absolutely incredible. People standing up testifying, worship going on for hours. I wouldn't have given anything for my children not to. I would have been devastated if they'd been locked away in a room somewhere and not, not being able to experience that. But there again, you got to have that church. I've seen some other church. I don't know if I'd punish my kids enough and make them sit through it. So you got to, so does spiritual discernment, to use your term, you have to weigh all those things out. <clears throat> now, I'm not looking for any church to hit 100% because it won't. Sure. I personally would want a church where the movement of the Spirit was a possibility. If I don't care if it didn't happen once every five years, I just want to know it was a possibility yeah. that my children, to use them as an example. And can I just put one thing in there about what you're talking about with the kids? I know of a church where this happened. They had a more anointed children's church mm-hmm. than they did the adult church. And it had got to the point That's true. To where the kids were actually coming out of the children's church into the sanctuary praying for the adults. That happened. Yeah. And that went on for a period of time. And that's happened somewhat at Shiloh. Oh, it did. I'm not saying that we didn't didn't have children's church, but in the days of revival, there was one little girl probably eight years old, I'm saying seven or eight, had parents, only child, only little girl. She wasn't no bigger than that, cuter than a button. And we had an outpouring of the Spirit in the service that day, and people were being prayed for and saved and healed and everything else. See, see, we didn't have any, back in those days of true revival, we didn't have any designated healers. <laughs> the Holy Ghost came in and just squashed us all. So this little girl's going around praying for people. They'd get healed, and they'd get, she would pray for them, and, and something happened to them, you know. And she was eight years old or whatever. And to me, and I was watching her, I thought, this is so cool. Mm-hmm. And she'd go around praying. Well, it, it wasn't long. She had this little line of people wanting her to pray for them, this sort of stuff. So she started praying for this one person, and they were there, and she prayed for them. And she was almost uh, in a like a trance-like thing. And the parents come, and I was there, and they said, Alan, we're getting scared. We know it's the Holy Spirit, but can you tell the Holy Spirit to stop? I said, well, we can <laughs> <No>. try. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, if you're scared, we can try it. I don't know. And and uh, and it was getting a little spooky. I mean, beyond, I mean, I thought it was the coolest thing since peanut butter at the beginning. Yeah, you get in about two hours of it, and you start getting this. Mm-hmm. It's it's like no, you know what's going on. So I just went over to her and put my hand on her head, and I said, "Well, Lord, if the parents are getting a little boogered here, is it okay if this little girl would stop praying now, whatever?" And that's all I said. I didn't know if I was going to be struck dead or what. To be honest with you. And uh, the little girl looked up at me and she turned around and went back to her parents, and that was it. And I don't think it was good or bad. Parents got scared, so I think it was fine for her to stop. But, I mean, she was flat going for it, and it was happening. You know, just to, yeah, I didn't I mean, mean to get off seen, track there, we've, but no, no, we, no. we've seen the children. We want them to get the influence of the adults, but it's really a rare occasion. But when you get it running the other way around, and yeah, these boy, little children I'm are, are full you. of God, and they're praying, it'll mess you. It'll oh, mess you I talk I appreciate up. that. I mean, not being, you know, I would have given anything, to, I think, to go back and be maybe raised like Jason. I feel like mm-hmm. I was shorted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. You know, half, well, you you can catch up fast. Life. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to provide that for my. You just hang out with me and Jeff. You'll catch. We'll yeah, catch you right, right we up. Got you. No problem. We got you. Covered. But I'm trying to provide that for my children. Oh, I'm right? proud. And, of and you. I can appreciate that because my daughter was her salvation took place at seven. And, That's wonderful. You know, in and she can quote. She was telling you who was, was she saying the first person that was translated into Latin. Yeah, she was talking about the Latin Vulgate. She, she just and, said that. And she knew and knew the dates and the, the whole deal. I mean, it but just, I, I've it was never so, heard that at home. Really? That was so cool because it just was a testimony to me, not only that she learned that truth, but she recognized it and heard it that day, and it stuck with her. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. In other words, she could relate to what we were talking about, the preservation of the Word of God. And how old was her? Was your daughter? She's nine. She's nine years old. And, man, she came up and she said, oh, yeah, you was talking about the Latin Vulgate. And she started quoting the dates and, the you know, all, all of the now stuff. she does get some of that at school, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So she goes to a Christian but, school. And, but, and, but what I'm saying is, she's even it. at that age, they can sit in the church services and they can get stuff. Well, we, we would always say at Shiloh that, 
and I'm sure we heard it somewhere, but it's true, but we would always say there's not such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. Well, I, I agree so, with that, too, because my four-year-old been talking for two weeks about riding a white horse. Really? <laughs> And what did you talk about this morning? Yes, sir. Yeah, boy. <laughs> so, so the Holy That's Spirit right. is the Holy Spirit. So That's so cool. I think what we have to be careful, and what, one thing that we realized there at, when revival was at Jeff's church was a lot of times as grown-ups, we'd be moving in testimonies or praying for each whatever. It wasn't unusual to a third of it to be flesh and two-thirds spirit. Yeah. But when the children moved, it's 100% spirit. It really was. You didn't have to, uh, you didn't have to really monitor was. anything. It was just, but you had to realize, and of course Jeff was good at preaching that, he would call it forth, but you just had to realize that there wasn't, there's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. So if ever how the Holy Spirit wants to use somebody, then we recognize it as the Holy Spirit, not yeah. just a child or sure. whatever. You know? That's exactly right. Well, that's and he was, he was very good in ministering that. Well, that's a direct scripture given to us is not to, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Take the children away from That's them. exactly right. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's right. Uh, they're the greatest in the kingdom of God, yeah. sure. according to Jesus. Yeah. And I think it's a, you know. So in spiritual discernment, I, that would be, with young children, that would be high up on my list. Now, I will tell, I will say this, though. That type of church is a hard one to find. Yes, sir. But it doesn't mean that it's not it's not out there. And, you know, I do think— um, But there again, a lot of it comes from home, too. It, does, yeah. it absolutely does. Cody and his wife, they, they have two girls. If I think now where I'm at, if I had children in my home that I was raising, I think that it would be extremely difficult— but also vitally important that those children are exposed to people in the church service that worship God, that they are exposed to prayer, to the preaching of the word that's sound. It's important for anybody. But I'm, I'm looking at it now. I'm saying, in some ways, this is going to sound crazy. Okay, I'm just going to say this. In some ways, I could survive just about in, in any church. We preach the common ground principles. You must believe Jesus was born of a virgin, mm -hmm. lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, rose again. If you believe in those common ground principles, we're part of the same family. But you and we, I also grew up in a generation that wasn't privy to Amazon Prime yeah. putting out a cartoon that glorifies Lucifer. Oh, exactly. I don't know if you've seen that. That's, well, that's a I just true, did last. Uh, I was thinking thing. I sent it to you, didn't I? You did. Yeah. And just about also, a week, yeah, about a week ago. Uh, now we have Satan cl Satanist clubs in schools. The church itself, those common ground principles are what makes us family. We may disagree on other points of doctrine, but those common ground principles must be there. Sure. And that that is the establishment of truth and word. Then you get into what, in the podcast we were talking about the marriage of the spirit and the truth. I do believe it's essential to get in a church that is spirit filled. And and I'm talking about in terms of even the expression. It's important. It would be important to me that my children see people in the congregation with their hands lifted up in praise to the Lord, with people praying, with people uh, sincerely seeking God. I think that's important. I believe that's important. And it's, it's hard for all of us to differentiate in spiritual things of the difference of what's a cultural preference and what's God or not. Yeah. You know, I pulled up something. I couldn't remember how it went, but I found it Spurgeon. He had a quote on discernment. I think he does pretty good. He says, discernment is not knowing necessarily the difference between right and wrong it is knowing the difference between right and almost right <laughs> oh, that's, 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 <laughs> that's really good <laughs> so i'm at, i'm still having to balance that with my own growth right i'm sure I, i'm coming up on 10 years on my own salvation yeah so i'm a child myself mm -hmm. so that's my sh balance and struggle, I got you. So. I got we do you. we do have some good internet wisdom here from facebook uh, oh, we okay. had uh, josh comment here and he said, just find the most woke church that pushes, <laughs> that pushes the most worldly agendas. That will increase your social credit score. 
That will surely trump discernment. <laughs> is, is, <laughs> is this your Josh that's doing this? Yes, I thought it. Now, now okay. say that. Read that one he more said, time. Just find the most woke church that pushes the most worldly agendas that will increase your social credit score. <laughs> that will surely trump discernment. Winning. You know that's easier to find than a good church. You won't have no trouble finding that. When Jeff yeah. said that he could survive in almost any church, I'm like, well... Well, I mean, I'm, Jason, I'm, I'm, Jason. I'm talking about Jason. in terms of... Uh, he wouldn't last five minutes. No, he'd take it I, over. I'm talking about... <laughs> he'd take it. Oh. Listen, he'd either have to take it over or blow it up. I know the guy. I'm talking about in terms, if you know, as far as doctrine goes. Sure. Sound doctrine's vitally significant and important to me. But I also understand that those common ground principles has to be... That has to be there. Then in a doctrinal setting... I may disagree with a lot of things, but that does not in any way, I have no mandate from Scripture that that breaks fellowship. Agreed. We're not gang members. Somebody said, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go there because it won't be perfect after you get there. Mm-hmm. And, and that would be true of everyone except for me. Yeah. But, you know, I am saying that there are some I think prerequisites, even from a spiritual personality standpoint, that enhances people's growth. Let me inject, I, I believe that. Let me inject a thought here, and y'all can shoot it up or tear it down. I have to believe that your heart's a pure heart, and I also believe it's not all your heart. I believe it's the Holy Spirit, and you're responding to the Holy Spirit. We claim it as our own, but truth is the Holy Spirit's putting that in you. And that hunger of a good church, I think, is put in by in you by the Holy Spirit. Too. Yeah. And not only that, if that's the case, if that's true, which I believe it is, then it's also true that he will lead you to that church. Sure, without a doubt. Because if you went out here trying to hunt for one, Heaven help. you're going to have to, I mean, your brain, it'll ne- you'll never find one. So it's of utmost importance to follow the Spirit and go to the church that the Lord leads you to, to me, is the important part, not the one that's going to fill a certain checklist because they'll all fail. Never. They'll all fail miserably. But the Lord's not going to lead you to the wrong place. It might be a little bit like what your family can receive, but also what your family can give to help others receive. You know how that works. Sure. I think what the spiritual discernment is important, but as we're talking, I hear a louder voice within me saying, God's saying, hey, I'm leading him. I will lead him to where he needs to go. And I think that leadership of the Holy Spirit will trump your brain if you'll let it. Because your brain getting the perfect, or, or not the perfect church, you're not saying that, but to get everything like I want it might get in the way of the Holy Spirit leading you. Just a thought. No, I, I agree. If I've yeah. got anything to do with it, it's yeah, I will. Be up. Yeah, because I'm sitting there thinking of where I would steer you, and I can't think of nowhere. But then the Lord, I hear the Lord saying, "Well, Alan, that's yeah, you're using your brain." Yeah, I mean, he he and Jeff and I like the scripture in Corinthians where it says that God's placed everyone in the body where it pleases Him. Yeah, sure. So he'll he'll play. He's he. You're in the placing process. Yeah, is what it is, and I think it's beautiful. I mean, because I don't hear many people sitting there saying, well, I'm trying to find a good church. I'm like, that's a lost statement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I and, haven't and, heard and that I, in 20 I, years. <laughs> and I am going to say this. I'm going to say this. When I was growing up, the church that impacted my life as far as doctrinally, theologically, spiritually, was Chilhowee Baptist Church. That church put an imprint on my life. Emmanuel Baptist Church in Abingdon, Virginia, did the same thing. Okay, now watch this. The next church that left an imprint on my life was the church down here that I pastored, Shiloh Tabernacle. And I was there for just a few weeks, I think, shy 20 years. And that church indebitably marked me and impacted me. I wandered in the wilderness after I left that church for a period of time. And through that wilderness, God was doing things in my life. He was really doing miraculous things in my life until I landed at the Grace Place. Now, for me, 
I can say, I almost was, would uh, say that, I, well, I don't think this would be wrong to say. Because I had other circumstances involved, I kind of didn't want to go there. But it was like, this is the only option. I have to go there. And when I got there, I was so at home. And it's been a growing process of being at home there to the point that the Grace Place is for me probably the church I will go to heaven from. Now, I'm saying that not knowing that the Lord may send me to Japan next next week. You know what I mean? You know please, what I'm saying? Lord, so I, I'm just saying. <laughs> Is that, that what you've been praying, Jason? Yeah, Jason's been praying that for ever since I met him, really. We need to get together. Yeah. I've been saying Africa. Yeah. We right. need to get together, Jay. Yeah. Yep. Y'all will never come up at the yep. same place because – Y'all can't agree on nothing. <laughs> but Let's go um, visit Bodie or uh, Bodie. Uh, yeah, Bodie. <laughs> <laughs> but when I when I got to the Grace Place, there's a guy, he's still there. You, you may have met him, I don't know. But I, I walked in and Roger Coffey was the first man to come over to me. And Roger Coffey shook my hand and he said, Boy, it's just good to have you here, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I think I got and, that introduction this morning. Did you? Really? <laughs> did you? Yeah, I think so. Here's the thing about Roger Coffey, though. Honestly, he was sincere, and I felt it. Sure. There was something about that that invited me in. And that place, though small, is a family. Mm -hmm. It's a family. So I found a home there. Now, I, I really, in the opposite way, I wasn't looking for a home. I was fine to wander aimlessly in the wilderness. I really was. God had a different plan, though, you know. So the Lord just directed my steps to agree with what Alan's saying. God just sort of sovereignly said, here. And he placed me in the body as it pleased him. I do believe in the sovereign hand of God guiding our steps when we just sincerely come before him and say, Lord, lead me. I think so, too. And I sent mm -hmm. this quote to Jason. I just pulled it up, what, two or three weeks ago. It says, what God does in us while we wait is just as important as what it is uh, we are waiting for. Yes, absolutely. Let me, let me give you the rest of the story of Jeff. Oh, here we go. Cody, be careful. Cover your Cody. ears. He said he was just fine with not being anywhere. Cody, not even kicking and screaming. Cody. Listen, the guy's got to preach. I don't care if it's a bunch of squirrels in the woods. <laughs> he's got to preach. And so the whole time he's not preaching, he, listen, I'd rather be around a mean, bad bull. So if is that man not guy, preaching about once or twice a week? He is not a happy man. Cody. <laughs> he is not happy. No, I will, can truth. I tell you, that is true. You're right. That is, that oh, is oh, wait, wait, we got a comment but I, here. We got uh, a comment from Allie. Oh. Yes, Alan, exclamation point, squirreling, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that from? That's <laughs> from your daughter. I don't know nobody named that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anymore. I disowned yes, her Alan. when she married Chad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, I got an amen right I, there. Well, well, here's, here's, and, here's, and counting the delay, she had to have already heard that in the spirit <laughs> before she. Even, no, listen, <laughs> she's heard it the last 30 years. <laughs> here's, here's the truth. Here's the truth, though. Seriously. Even when, when I was wandering aimlessly in the wilderness, God, in his sovereign power, in his sovereign will, I, I was out in Illinois, and I was at a Presbyterian church, and we were fixing to set up and sing in there, right? And they come out and said, uh, oh, by the way, we want you to preach, too. It's not like that they knew I was a preacher. Good thing you read they just hard. said, we want you to <laughs> preach, right? So... I preached in, a pres in that Presbyterian church and then later did revivals in that Presbyterian church, which in turn, I started doing revivals in the Methodist churches out in Southern Illinois and Indiana. And I was doing revivals in charismatic churches out there. I was doing revivals in Baptist churches out there. I even held revivals in a Nazarene church he would, listen, several times. He would switch um, his messages, the fit to the denomination, <laughs> just so he could preach. Now, I'm just here. I'm I'm the truth here. Come on, Allie. Give me an amen. I, I was Allie, don't, don't, he would toast so... He, I mean, he can make his message. He doesn't violate Scripture. <laughs> But he, know, he knows where to put the lows and the lows <laughs> well, and where question, to put the highs on the highs. My question knew, from that was, how long did it take before they were Dispensational Baptist Church? 
Oh, when I left there, they, oh, were, they were all dispensational. Yeah, yeah well, they uh, were dispensational. They didn't know the it. They didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I mean, I, listen, I was. Says. Amen. 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 What Allie says. <laughs> Allie, you need to. You, I'll be talking to you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you knew where to put the what? So no, like, watch this. No, listen. What, this part. What about the rapture or rapture? What? Yeah, watch. You know the- <laughs> <laughs> this part is true, and and uh, this part got, is true. Yeah, well, no, yeah. watch this. Seriously, I'd go in Methodist churches and preach eternal security. I'd go in Nazarene churches and preach eternal security. I'd preach pre-tribulation rapture in Presbyterian churches, and I would preach it. Sure. The odd thing is, is people would sit there and they'd agree with me. Now, whether it changed them or not, I can't tell you. But I did do that because that's where God had me at the time. And, I, I had a know. person tell me one time, said, Alan, said, you tend to try to keep Jeff preaching. I said, yeah, <laughs> I do that. I'll, I'm guilty of that. Once again. Well, you know it's true. <laughs> Cover and I say, yeah, I, I try to keep him preaching. And he said, well, do you think that's the will of God? I said, well, I have no idea. I just don't want to listen to his belly ache. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I have to live with him. The rest of you don't. <laughs> uh, back to what you were saying, Alan, about being in a church where there's the chance of the spirit moving. Yes. I think that's the most, I think that's the most earth shattering thing that was said to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do too. I can look back. And the on, most important yeah, thing. I can look back on my childhood and I can't tell you one time where children's church was an important thing. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you when the spirit moved. Yeah. And to me, that's what defines the rest of yes. your life as a, Absolutely. As a person. Let, let, it's what can. Let me interject this, talking about spiritual discernment, back to what Old at Heart said there on the spiritual discernment. And when talking about a movement like that, Jason, when you're in a service and you want to discernment if it's God or not, if you have a movement of the spirit, what somebody's calling a movement of, of the spirit, and there's not a tear it ain't a movement. Yeah. That's all I That's got right. to tell you. That's right. Now, you got somebody out there shouting and demanding this mm-hmm. devil do that and this and do that and this, and you got all these people demand discernment. That's that right. That ain't God. That's right. And so, but listen, when you're in a service and there's a sweet spirit about it, people are worshiping, maybe a testimony or two. When God moves, the most we ever saw God move was not a man moving God. In other words, we'd be worshiping, testimony, People would be getting healed in the audience. This would be getting saved. They didn't nobody go up to nobody. Sure. We were just worshiping God. I'm That's telling right. the truth, yeah. Yes, sir. We were just worshiping God. Yeah. See, I can feel the presence come yeah, right boy. there. That's right. We were just worshiping yeah. God yeah. and praising God and giving That's testimony, right. and God was popping people all over. And we, all over. And we'd turn around and we'd say, spots. what? And I remember we were in one service. It a mixed congregation, black, white, and mm-hmm. Japanese and everybody else. Holy Ghost hit this one black guy back there, scared Jeff to so somebody better help him. Yeah. We didn't know what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> went, they were, that's not true. That exactly I mean, right. we were so naive. We didn't I, know what God I, was I, doing. I thought, Something wrong with that man. Somebody and needs then, to go over our head. And him. help him. <laughs> and then there was another guy fell over rock dead yeah. of a heart attack. Yeah. He dead her in a hammer now yeah. and stayed dead for a good bit because yeah. there was a, a nurse there. Two right, nurses. Two nurses that yeah. worked in the heart place and yeah. the hospital and they were there and they looked at jeff said he, he's, he's dead. gone he's gone so jeff just had church well let's pray till they till nine what the ems yeah. gets here we'll just pray so we just stopped and prayed and before the ems got back here he got up i mean got up and he got a breath cody so and what you're saying jeff took him it. out but god brought him back that's exactly <laughs> right <laughs> can i tell y'all something? can i tell you something about that can i tell you what i was preaching that good before? observation jason <laughs> i was preaching on hypocrites Oh, and Buddy, I was oh, he, hide, he I was, was scalded and hide. He was pulling the wallpaper off the wall. And, and he just laid over dead. Now, let me tell you something. You'll scare a Baptist to life if you die on him. Yeah, that's right. And he was, <laughs> I didn't know what he didn't know. He was in over his head. You better know. But I'll tell you was. what happened. Oh. God raised him from the dead, and he got called to preach, that same guy. He sure did. <laughs> he did. He did. God raised him up. and He was taking, I don't know how many pills a day oh, it was a for his heart, for and he got down after that to where he was taking nothing but a baby aspirin. Now, you see, to be honest with you, I would want my little children to see that. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, I, just, I mean. Scar them for life. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you, if you <laughs> don't mess them up, mess them up good. Yeah. <laughs> but the point was discernment 
How can I have spiritual dis- discernment here? If there's somebody standing up there saying they got this and they got that, and you listen to me, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to tell the devil do that, I'm going to tell God to do that, use your spiritual discernment. That's probably not going Well, and that's why it's a two-part question, spiritual and mm-hmm. scriptural Correct. discernment. Yeah, right? that's good. Yes. And it so, is a two-part question. Because when and the Spirit of God, deep questions. when the Spirit of God moves in, a true Spirit of God, you don't have to ask the question. That's right. And everybody in the room pretty much <laughs> is scared. Yeah. No. You don't. Scared. You don't. You might have somebody pop up just a little in the flesh, but it's not much. Yeah. Because the presence of God so thick, you're just this side of scared. And we say we enjoyed it, but we were scared too. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. About ten Good. minutes in, you'll see the professional pop up. Well, that, that's what happened, actually. That's yeah. what shut the whole thing that's what down. Shut it down. Well, Jonathan was, Edwards said in his diary, God send revival. God send revival. But send it without any flesh. We want it to be 100% you, Lord. And then several entries later, there was an entry. God, send revival. Flesh and all. Just send revival. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Because he'll take care of the flesh. He'll take care of the flesh. And, it, and you're going to have some. You're going to so have some. And it's okay. It's unavoidable. Yeah, because when we were, we're still in flesh. We're still in flesh. When we were out there in revival, I hate to keep referring to it, but it gives us a benchmark. We had one guy that came to me, and he said, Alan, I don't understand it. I said, what is it? He said, I love everybody in here. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of them unlovable. You got to trust me. <laughs> I just got to say uh, this one thing. I know we're, are we out of time? We're about, out of time. Okay. Out of well, time. let me just say this one thing as just a testimony to what you can expect. My children came <laughs> through that revival, right? It was a wonderful thing, wonderful experience. On the backside of that, my daughter, Allie, since the revival, got married to a guy named Chad. So wonderful I just guy. want to wonderful say to young you man. that be careful with your daughters in revival because after the revival's over, it goes just plumb right down. There's nothing you can <laughs> Chad, do for them at that Chad, time. Chad, close your ears. I mean, Stop you up know. your ears. So I just want to warn you, if uh, there is a Chad <laughs> that comes uh, you know, to one of your girls, Old Please talk heart. to me first. Old heart. We should have stopped this podcast about three minutes ago, Jason. <laughs> See, Roland. Because Chad Roland is had to get even. hideous. He had to He's get even with Allie hideous. for her telling the truth there. Thank you, Allie. Love you, girl. Somebody pray for us. Go for it, old at heart. Yeah, pray for us. Thank you, God, for the opportunity for just gathering two or three here together. Hey, Amen. So, um, That's good. Just God, me and my family. Yes, Amen. Lord be with us and Lord just be with these individuals here and you know, just help spread the word as you see fit Amen. we love you in Jesus name Amen, Amen. that's Amen. good Amen. Adios. praise God adios yep. amigo yep. thank you for joining today's Smith and Rowan show you can check out our website at kingdompropheticsociety.org and our daily unplugged podcast at smithandrowanshow.podbean.com You can also join us on Amazon, Apple, or Spotify.